Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to week nine of Principles of Commercial Law. Hard to believe that we're yeah so close to the end of the term already. It feels like um, we've only just started in some ways, but here we are. Uh, this week, we're talking about um, competition and, and the various ways in which the Competition and Consumer Act seeks to uh, regulate competition and and promote competition uh, and conversely tries to discourage and prevent uh, anti-competitive practices in um, in a variety of forms. Uh, as we discussed last week, I've got uh, an example um, memo to sort of give you a look at what how you might start structuring the your exam answer. Um, so we'll, we'll talk, I've done that based on the response to problem two for today's hypothetical questions. Um, and so what I might do, we might jump straight into question one. Um, we'll have a, have a discussion about that and then we'll move on to problem two. I'll give a bit of an overview of the memo of advice and, and the, the things that you should be focusing on, the things that you can plan for, I suppose. Uh, and then we can, we can talk through the example, um, question to problem two, but let's start with question one. So a, a bit more of a discursive question, uh, for this one. So what is the goal of the restricted trade practices provisions? Is it economic efficiency or is it something else? I didn't really go into too much detail in this one, but I just sort of said <clears throat> um, it talks about in the object of the Act of, at Section 2, one of the purposes to enhance the welfare of Australians through promotion of competition, basically. But when you sort of, you know, look into economic efficiency, it basically means, um, you know, so that all goods in the economy are distributed. You know, it's like an economic definition that the distributed in accordance with their most valuable usage and waste is eliminated and minimized. Um, it's economically efficient if the factors of production are used at a level at or near their capacity. Um, so I guess the answer that I came to was it, it is economic efficiency, but not just economic efficiency. By achieving economic efficiency, you also achieve um, you know, welfare benefits for people that are involved in markets. So it's at least those two things, but probably others, but I just left it at that. Yeah. Okay. So thinking about economic efficiency as being um, one of the goals, but not the only goal. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyone else? And and good reference to section two as well on that one. Uh, anyone else? I wrote that the goal of is to regulate the conduct by corporations and individuals through restrictive trade practices by governing corporations and individuals who reduce competition in the marketplace um, and all, yeah, substantially lessening competition um, for the benefit of companies, individuals in the long run. So yep. founded on the, plus it's also the regulations are founded on the principles of economics about how markets work best in the interests of all Australians, businesses and individuals. Okay. Yep. So thinking about bringing into account uh, different, different interests, but focusing particularly on, um, on the individual and, and what might be best for individuals. Yeah. Um, anyone Anyone else wanted to weigh in on this one? One of the things that uh, we might think about, and and in some ways it ties into Jason's idea about economic efficiency is is part of it, but there might be there might be more, or there might be other things as well. Is to think about this idea as as competition as being about both efficiency and progression. Um, and so efficiency is part of the conversation, but also thinking about progress, um, competition, driving innovation and, and those sorts of things. And both of those, um, let's call them goals or objectives as being brought about by um, impersonal market pressures. So 
this idea that um, the the market should be left to itself, and in doing so, the competition will will foster e- efficiency and progression. And what's interesting about the the these competition uh, provisions is that they they do intervene in the market, right? It's not just impersonal market pressures. There's there's government regulation. There's there's this added. Um, it's not just the pure or the raw market, and and we don't have to go into this debate. But there's debate around how much intervention is appropriate. Um, what what level of intervention um, would achieve greater competition versus um, you know, if you if you leave the market to itself, will it will it figure out the best way? Uh, and so, when we think about economic efficiency as being one of, but not the only objects of these um, restricted trade practices provisions, um, we need to be thinking about these the the appropriateness of the the level of intervention as well as being a a part of the mix. Um, Arguably, intervention is um, introduces inefficiency, and so the goal can't be economic efficiency because that that would be paradoxical. But there's the counter argument that by setting up the framework for um, more robust competition or or preventing anti competitive practices, there's an argument that. Um, it actually furthers economic efficiency. So you know you could you could come down on on either side of that argument. I'm not I'm not terribly fussed either way. Um, but when we when we're thinking about these provisions in in the terms of economic efficiency, um, just sort of understanding the 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 political and the I suppose principled ideas that underpin some of it as well. Um, yeah. Any other? comments on that question one just paraphrasing the remarks in qcma the yeah, type yeah. qcma about the primary purpose and intent of the restrictive trade practices is to regulate against the restrictive trade practices the regulations are founded on the principles of economics about how markets work best in the interests of australia and its businesses most importantly focusing on the crucial part it plays in addressing social and economic goals by balancing them out um, and uh, recognising that competition is the primary driver to economic progress. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's 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 this sort of this curious um, debate that I don't think we'll ever fully resolve because so much of it comes down to different perspectives and, and different principles, but this idea of... Um, whether um, whether intervention into a market makes the market better or worse, um, or more efficient or less efficient, and, and these sorts of ideas as well. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excellent. Well, let's let's move on to question two, um, which gives us a brief little scenario about um, the industrial cleaning chemical industry. Um, there's been some drastic discounting, a bit of a price war. Um, and during the industry lunch, a director of one of the main suppliers suggested that the answer was for everyone to agree to price at 10% above cost. So stop the discounting and, and everyone would price at 10% above cost. There was a general consensus, but they made it clear that there could be no agreement. Subsequently, the price war ended and all firms charged at 10% above cost. Has there been a controversial contravention of the Competition and Consumer Act. So what we'll do with this question, as I said, I've prepared a sort of a response in the memo format. What we'll do, I'll I'll give some initial guiding comments about the memo of advice and, and how it compares to the letter of advice that you've previously comp- completed in this unit. Then I'll open it up for a discussion on the problem itself and, and get your responses and and ideas in relation to the hypothetical scenario. And then we'll take a look at the example that I've done up, which will hopefully draw those ideas that you've raised together and and set out how you might structure them in in the memo format. And so 
I guess some initial comments about about the memo. And fundamentally, it's not that different from the letter of advice in that the the key bulk of the discussion would be the same regardless of, of whether it was a memo or a letter of advice. So you still need to correctly outline the um, relevant legal provisions. You still need to outline the key test cases. You still need to be including a, um, a, a critical analysis and, and be able to apply the law to the facts with a, a degree of, of nuance and, and a close attention to the facts. Um, you still need to be thinking about if you feel like there are gaps in the facts, what what those gaps are, what more information you might need, and and um, what uh, what the impact of that more information would be, um, and keeping in mind the the practical consequences for the client, or or considering what the different options might be. So all of that, whether it's a letter of advice or whether it's a memo, all of that remains the same. The way in which the the memo might be different from the letter is for one, the introduction is is a little bit different. You obviously not saying, you know, here's here's our letter of advice. And in terms of formatting, um there's a less strict um, onus on on the way that you format it, but you still need to be following a nice clear structure. It's still great if you can separate. If there are multiple issues, being able to separate those issues out and and present them in a clear and logical way. The scenario that you'll be given in the exam sets up um, a, a senior partner who who's just in the morning gotten these details from a new client, they just quickly need to be briefed on the issue before they go into an interview with the client. So they want a good overview of what the issues are, what the relevant law might be, what the likely options will be, but also a sense of um, what more information might be needed from the client and and what the different options to discuss with the client would be and, and um, you know, the, pos- the possible consequences of those. The... The scenario, um, I think, I think there might be a temptation to say, "Oh, well, if the scenario is being directed to a senior partner, um, they probably know the law already; they don't need to be told it again." Um, the two, the two points I'd make in response to that one is just um, from a, a very practical marking perspective. Um, in that, uh, in the academic world rather than the real world, um, I still need to be able to to give you marks based on your knowledge of of the content, um, and so in order to do that, you need to demonstrate that knowledge to me. So you still need to um, highlight that you know the relevant provisions, you know the relevant test cases, and things like that. Um, but the second point I would make is that even in practice. Um, Sometimes the, you know, your supervisors, whoever you you might be giving um, some sort of draft memo to will want to be reminded of these things as well. If it's, if it's uh, an area of law that, you know, broadly they know, but they haven't really looked at it in the past few years or they, they know the area well, but it's a, it's a really specific niche issue that, they haven't looked at before these sorts of things. So even even in a, a practical scenario, you still might be in a situation where you do need to be stepping through um, some of the more, uh, let's say, knowledge elements of what's the law, how does it apply, what are the relevant cases, what was held in those cases, those sorts of things. So just making sure that you still cover those bases off and, and don't just assume, well, the audience is a partner in a law firm rather than a client, therefore I don't need to talk about those things. You can, you don't necessarily need, and I mean, I'd say this for a letter of advice anyway, you don't need to be super descriptive 
Um, you know, we don't need whole chunks of copied and pasted legislation and things like that. Um, it's a good idea to be summarizing and, and not wasting too many words on just restating the law, um, but making sure that you are still including that discussion and not being tempted to to cut that out is is important. Um, in terms of a conclusion, and and we talked in relation to the um the letter of advice, the first assessment that one of the things that we probably could have improved on as a cohort was adding a bit more nuance into the discussion the, the discussion in that there was a a group of answers that were quite definite you know the sale of goods act would definitely apply or um the um uh what was his name stephen definitely had apparent authority um and i've and i've suggested that there's scope to be it's still good to come to a conclusion but acknowledge the um the, the lack of certainty. So, you know, it's it's likely that Stephen would have apparent authority um, because ABC. Um, uh, we, we could make a strong argument that the Sale of Goods Act applies because blah, blah, blah. So just being able to reflect that nuance, that's really important to convert that across into the, the memo of advice as well. Even though we're not necessarily saying directly to the client this time, look, here's what your options are, or here's what the likely outcomes would be. Um, we still want to be feeding that information through to the partner so that when they get in the room um, with the client after the exam's finished, um, they're in a position to talk through those options and talk through what the the likely com um, outcomes might be. So including all of that and, and including all of that nuance as well is um, is just as important with the memo as it would be with the um, with the letter of advice. I'm happy to leave that discussion there, and then and then once I've heard from you guys for a bit on problem two, then we'll look at the example. But were, were there any, uh, I suppose, general questions about the memo that anyone had at this stage? No, silence and shaking head. So I'll, I'll take that as a no. That's all good. Okay. Well, let's let's look at problem two, and then and then we can work through the example. So I'll throw it over to you guys. What what leapt out in relation to this um, this industrial cleaning scenario? Identifying that that's the legal issue would be the cartel conduct. Yep. By, by price fixing. Um, getting all the huge competitors, all the big players in the in the industrial chemicals um, meeting and having this arrangement in place. So that's what I identified that it would be cartel conduct. They were trying to price fix at 10% above cost. Yep. Okay. So identifying issues around price fixing and then focusing on this idea that you know the 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 directors are all in the room having a conversation about this, and so that that potentially raises problems. Yep. What else? Or how can we elaborate on some of those <clears throat> ideas uh, in more detail? I guess um, one of the things I'd say is yeah. So just to add on to that, um, yeah, it was a director of one of the main suppliers, so. I, I, big person with obviously a lot of market power, but then there was no sort of written or verbal agreement, it seems. It was more better described as an understanding because um, yep. I think the textbook talks about the distinction between agreement and understanding. Agreement, I think, essentially needs to have something more. Um, and also there's evidence that as the outcome of this meeting was, in fact, uh, a change in the market as per that tacit understanding. Yep. So looking at in um, looking at the outcome and that being in line with what was discussed. Yep. I I guess from there, like, so I looked at the facts like that, and to try and answer the question, I had to sort of start 
like differentiate between division one and division two of the competition code to try yep. and because there's so many things in division two to try and yeah. tick through if they do or do not apply. It gets kind of complicated once you get there to some degree. Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. Um, okay. So we're thinking about cartel contact and price fixing. We're thinking about whether there's enough there for a, um, for an agreement versus an understanding and then thinking through some of the specifics of um, Division One and, and Division Two um, provisions. Yep. Uh, what else? When you go through the checklist um, about the after looking at the contract arrangement, you look at the purpose and the likely effect. Well, if you look at the effect, then you could probably a court would probably see that it would give rise to a lessening of competition because no other businesses outside the cartel arrangement would have, well, well they'd have adverse economic effects on their business because they wouldn't be able to compete. So you would look at that as an effect. You would look at the fact that um, when you look at the checklist, uh, section 45, uh, I think it's AD, um, that the... Um, conspirators in this cartel and um, price fixing arrangement were all in competition. So it satisfies that part of it. Um, and I look, looking at um, all those checklist items, it, my conclusion was that it gives rise to a price fixing and, um, and then, of course, pursuant to Section 45 AG, uh, actually, um, I think it was 45 AG, that the companies would be subject to a pecuniary fine of about $50 million if they were found guilty. Okay, so thinking about, um, and, and I mean, we, we, we can talk a, a little bit at the end um, about the uh what the the likely effects might be in terms of consequences but um just in terms of those penalties thinking about the um 45 af which creates an offense for um making the contract or arrangement or understanding that is effectively a cartel provision and then um 45 ag which is giving effect to the um the cartel understanding in this probably in this instance so yeah thinking thinking about the the making of versus the giving effect to yep uh what else well i guess for me just to well probably not really giving much else but I thought that the contract arrangement and understanding element, the purpose effect or purpose condition and the um, final one, other parties in competition seemed pretty straightforward and the textbook didn't really go through, you know, any sort of complex cases to work out that stuff. So it was kind of seemed like you just worked that out on the facts. But I guess one thing I was thinking about was uh, I read in the textbook that um, some of these things that appear to be um, – cartel conduct can often be brought down to or explained by market forces. For example, in the, one of those circumstances can be a price war. So if you've got a, a price war where people are uh, in a very strong competition, you logically sort of end up where prices actually end up being essentially the same. Um, whilst doesn't mean that that in fact happened. I just thought it was relevant to think about because it's probably something they'll try and argue. Yeah, absolutely. So, so focus two parts of that. One, focusing in on the key element here is going to be um, whether there is this, um, and let's focus in on understanding because I, um, you know, I think I think you're right in your earlier comments that there's not there's not enough there to sustain an argument that there's been an agreement or an arrangement. We are considering whether or not there's an understanding. Um, that's the key issue. If if we can establish that there has been an understanding, then 
um, as Bill said, I think it's pretty straightforward to to outline that it um, would have the likely effect of reducing competition. Um, so the key thing is is whether there's been this understanding. Um, and so to the second point, unpacking what's actually required to um, to demonstrate that there has been that understanding versus um, whether it's just um, uh, a, a result of um, competition, market forces, um, or or some other um, whether there's some other explanation that's not uh, reaching this this understanding that that relates to cartel conduct. That's that's a really good thing to be focusing on. Um, Jacob, can I just jump in there for a second? Mm -hmm. So they're, they're at a lunch, they're having this meeting. Generally, those sort of things could be documented as such. So one of these things that could be raised in the memo is, is there actually written evidence regarding what was discussed during this lunch? Okay, so like, as in like, if there were like minutes of That's right. the discussion yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, from, from a memo point of view, we talked about what we need to ask the client when they turn up as such from the exam point of view. They would be the things you would highlight though in that memo to make sure that there was nothing written. Yeah, yeah. Well, people. oh, as in so you're saying if... Um, well, either minuted or some sort of an agreement, like we're, we're working on it's an understanding at this point. Yeah, but yeah. But we haven't actually clarified with anyone at this point whether or not there has been something formally written or signed off on yes yeah absolutely um so yeah what you could do and and when i show my example we'll sort of see that the the last paragraph lists off you know here's here's the tentative conclusion based on the the discussion on the facts and and some of the assumptions that we've made based on these facts but if there was other evidence, and in particular, what what other evidence we might be looking for, here's how that that conclusion would change. So yeah, that's that's a really great point. Um, and so there's two elements to that. The first is, yeah, obviously, if there if there was something in writing that was you know shared around and, and people signed or something, then obviously that's that then very much starts to look like uh, a, a, an agreement or an arrangement. But even beyond that, um, some sort of record of the discussion, um, like minutes of, of the, the meeting, might uh, give greater clarity to the facts in terms of, you know, the facts make mention of, oh, there was a general consensus that blah, um, but well, they had a motion put forward, like, you know, like that's normally how your meetings would run if there was a general discussion or an action put forward, that that is how they would progress the matter with them all affirming that that's how they're going to proceed. Yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, you could, I suppose the broader point is you could say there'd be more evidence that we'd be looking for or more information that we'd be looking for. And, and here's how it would, would change the discussion. Um, my my reaction to it was an industry lunch was maybe it wouldn't quite be as formal as that in terms of you know a, a really a minuted meeting that um had, that had motions and things like that. And it's not to say that that couldn't have happened um but the i think you could equally say that this was something that was more of an informal discussion over lunch but, you know, everyone in the room kind of knew what they were saying and they were just being very careful not to say it. And that's sort of, and, and so the discussion then is, is that an understanding, an understanding? Um, so let's, let's consider, are there any cases that might help us hone in on this idea of, of an understanding or, or what forms an understanding? Wasn't there the um, the APGO cases? Yep. And also, I was reading the other day the just a recent case of the Director of Public Prosecutions and Joyce 2022, where he and his company were found guilty of price fixing and cartel conduct. 
because he was one of the major players of a pharmaceutical, a biopharmaceutical product. And he was fixing the price locally in Australia and he was a major exporter of this particular product that made some pharmaceuticals that Australia was importing back. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, and uh, they're not, they're not really in the lecture materials, but in terms of recent examples, just a lot of the ideas around um, uh, medical, medical supplies and, and shortages as a result of pandemic disruptions over the past few years. And now thinking as well about um, uh, uh, energy and, and in particular gas, you know, where, where the the conversation a while ago was heavily on petrol and petrol pricing, which is why a lot of these cases are um, are sort of in that sphere. Um, the the new target is yeah, sort of these these supply chain disruptions caused by COVID, and then and then um, the the war in Ukraine and that sort of stuff as well. So yeah, just just I suppose a broader comment about the the interesting way that there's these there's these trends in in competition as well. Uh, but let's talk about Appco and and how that might um, help us in figure out what's going on in this scenario. So what what was that case about and and how can it how can it help us with this one they had a, an informal arrangement there was a whole lot of players in ballarat at the time um some branded independents that had some type of formal or informal arrangement that they would all at the same time um when the pricing cycle was over, that they would increase their prices, they would contact each other um, and all price their service stations at the same price. And um, so they were colluding and yeah, fixing the prices in that way. Um, and there was probably about, I think, five or six players involved in that. And I think the principle was, and most of them were found guilty and fined for um, taking part in that price fixing and cartel conduct. Yeah, um, Jason, I can see your microphone. Oh, uh, I was just going to say, was that was that particular case in the textbook? Because I was going to um, ask about a different section type thing. Uh... I can't remember off the top of my head if Apco's in the textbook or not. Was there what? What would, did you want to ask? Well, what I was going to ask was because I didn't really go into too much. Like I, I noted a case here: trade practices and tube makers. It's you know really similar facts, but the textbook was talking about section forty-five about lessening competition, which is in the other provisions section, and then it goes on to cartel conduct. And I didn't really make the connection between essentially. Uh, those facts and, you know, being section 45, a sort of different context, being able to be used in the cartel um, conduct example. But in retrospect now, I would probably do that. I just don't, I got confused by that a bit. Okay. Um... I agree also with Jason, because I used that case also, the Jew makers case, because it was about price and it was about having an arrangement. and At a meeting, yeah fixing a price on on their steel in WA. Mm. Okay, so so I guess I thought the textbook was trying to tell me this is a different context, if that makes sense. Um like section 45, this is solely about um, you know, reducing competition, which so se section 45 might apply in in this case as well. But I guess I just thought, okay, cartel conduct cartel conduct um so i was looking for cases in that section of the chapter that ex would explain understandings and it wasn't there it just talks about the act and it's like well if there's an understanding there's an understanding basically okay so i guess trying to i'm just i'm just trying to make sure that i'm understanding the question so um are you asking the 
the difference between cartel conduct versus price fixing or um well i guess that's the confusing thing it's it sounds like if if you read the uh page 245 and 246 it's it's talking about section 45 which is about just reducing competition but the facts in tube makers sound really similar to what's happened here so trying to understand the difference between cartel conduct and conduct that it can also be or is different if it's called you know defined as reducing competition right um and let me let me have have another read of the textbook and i might post mm. up on teams um a bit more of a a considered answer to that once i've double checked there. But in retrospect, I would use those three cases at page 246. But yeah, on face value, it just seemed like the context was different. Yeah. So I suppose the the broader I suppose the the broader idea to be thinking about some of this is when we're thinking about um cartel conduct or or um cartel conduct can be sort of thought of as a bit more of an umbrella term which might include price fixing or um, in some way um, playing playing around with production and, and supply to inflate price and those sorts of things or um, organising between um, different players in the markets to allocate customers or, or um have particular territories or supplies, those sorts of things. So cartel conduct is sort of the um, the umbrella term of which price fixing these sorts of practices um, might be examples. So you could have you could have price fixing that indicates um, cartel conduct, but um, you could also have other um, anti-competitive, practices between players in a particular market, which could be cartel conduct, but is not necessarily price fixing. Does that make sense? I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. It know if does, that's what I guess. Asking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you have time, I'll just try and work out why that trade practices commission at tube makers isn't cartel conduct as well. Because it sounds really similar to what this circumstance is about. Right. Okay. I'll um. I'll yeah. I'll have another look and I'll I'll pop something up on Teams. Yep. Um. Jacob, cool. I have a question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, will that um be relevant discussing the sections as it's in the study guide forty five A Q and ninety seven, which talks about recommended price agreements, like the fact that the director is discuss is recommending. Uh, would you consider that? Or not? Um, because the section doesn't explain, then it goes all broadly in section forty-five. But yeah, so a recommended price agreement tends to be, um, if if you sort of think about in a particular, um, I'll say industry, it's probably not the best descriptor, but you think there can be sort of vertically. And I feel like economists or business people would have a different way of thinking about this, but you can think vertically in terms of um, uh, manufacturer, um, wholesaler, retailer, let's say, and then you can think of horizontally uh, different manufacturers, different wholesalers, different retailers. With the recommended pricing, that tends to be a scenario where we're dealing with the vertical chain um, and it might be this case that let's say the the wholesaler distributes to multiple retailers and the wholesaler has recommended pricing. And so as a result of that recommended pricing, the retailers have um, similar or the same pricing, um, but it's, it's coming from sharing the same wholesaler. Um, whereas the cartel conduct is... Um, interested in the horizontal links between the different competitors. Um, and so that's that's why with, with recommended pricing, you could have a scenario where horizontally different retailers in competition have the same price, 
but it's not price fixing or, or cartel conduct because horizontally they don't actually have anything to do with with one another so i think it's a good point um but it it wouldn't apply in this in this scenario i wouldn't i wouldn't have thought plus it wouldn't meet the competitors test or be in competition with each other also uh well in this let me double check the way that it's worded they they um directors in the industry so they're they're in competition with one another um but the the difficulty is is that they're not necessarily it's not a um a recommended pricing structure vertically it's this issue of horizontally um have have these different competitors reached an understanding I thought you were talking hypothetical. Uh, um, Sorry. Um, you were talking about this particular case. Okay. Well. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. 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 So, so because, because it's vertically, um, you know, the wholesaler and the retailer are not in competition with another, each other. Is that, is that sort of what you were saying? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, cool. So we're thinking, we're thinking cartel conduct. We're thinking potentially, um, price fixing um and in particular where we're focusing on has there been some kind of uh understanding let's say so the thing the thing that we can think about is in apco that's relevant and and what's what's important about apco is that in that case, even though there was a um, the group of competitors who seemed to have um, reached an agreement, and indeed in in um, some of the other cases, the conduct was found to be um, uh, cartel conduct. What was interesting and important on in APCO on appeal was that the full court was willing to recognize that the um that apco hadn't actually they hadn't reached an understanding with the other competitors that they would follow the pricing structure um and and there was particular reference was made to um Justice Lindgren's comments in uh, ACCC and um, CC New South Wales, where there was discussion about what what's needed for an understanding to form, and in particular, these ideas around um, there's got to be some sort of undertaking um, that the parties will act in a particular way. Um, and and what was significant in APCO was that the the CEO of APCO hadn't actually given that undertaking that he would he would um, reduce the price for match or, or follow the price pricing on the list. It was there was still that option to take a different route, take a different path, and and so this this idea that an understanding isn't just um oh okay well we've all we've all had a chat about it and we all seem to be on the same page there's there's got to be more than that and and there's got to be this undertaking um or, or commitment to act in a particular way um and so one thing that you could argue and and in my example i've been a bit of a devil's advocate and said that it wouldn't be cartel conduct because I've argued that, that that undertaking was seems to be missing on the facts that they're given. Um, yes, yes, they've all reached the general consensus that something needs to be done and and this 10% um, uh, this temp pricing at 10% above cost seems to be a, a good way to go. But on the facts that we're given so far, no one in that room actually said, 
well, yep, I I'll do it. I'll I'll as soon as we leave this room, I'm gonna go back to the office and I'm gonna say let's price at ten percent uh, above cost. Instead, there's and and you know you read into the facts that they've all deliberately been quite coy about this. They've all just sort of looked around the room and said, "Oh, wow, that'd be that sounds like a great idea." Um, yeah, if only we could all, if only we could all do that, but, oh, well, I guess that's what it will be. Um, and they've deliberately fallen short of giving that undertaking or, um, or allowing that, that expectation to arise, um, based on these facts. Uh, and so, and, and I mean, if, if you looked at, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say one thing. I guess the thing that I've found difficult about that, acknowledging I didn't read APCO to get that the bits that are needed for an understanding, that the facts indicate they in fact did set all their prices at 10%. So it's it's a bit like, you know, they've gone into a room and said, let's make a cartel, but by the way, we're, we're not actually making a cartel, but the outcome is a cartel. So it's it's a bit it's it's kind of crazy that, you know, you need that extra bit for an understanding, despite the fact that every single person in fact did set their prices at that specific price. Yeah. Um, well, and, and what I was, what I was about to say was that if, if you'd concluded that, um, that this, that there is enough there to form that understanding, um, I would, I would be happy with that as well. And I've, and I've deliberately in my example, gone with, um, the, the option or the argument that's maybe a bit counterintuitive, in some ways, just to make a point, and the point is that I'm less interested in what you conclude than I am in about the way that you go about arguing it. Right. So if you if you said and and I may as well I might share my screen now and, and we can talk through the example. Um, if you um, and so like I've sort of. That's not the right one. Before you go on to that, Jacob, just yeah, rereading yeah. about what we're talking about, say practices and tube makers being the steel yeah, yeah. case yep. that we're talking about earlier. The distinction I'm making with that case, as opposed to what we're talking about with cartel, is that there were people within tube makers that they were trying to make this decision. So you've got like the manager and the director trying to make a decision as opposed to other bodies trying to make a decision as a whole to try and do like they were just talking about for the money that they were going to make from the company as opposed to three or four different individuals or companies trying to bring a price fixing okay so so well i'm interpreting that could have case. been vertical rather than horizontal are you saying yeah like from the way it reads it's saying that the director and the manager are the ones who are having this discussion in regards about to price to do. about as opposed to three or four different companies getting together to try and price fix. Okay. Yeah. I'll have to, it's I'll have to I'm, take another I'm look at tube makers. Yeah. Um, and is that the distinction that Jason's trying to understand is my question, I guess. Possibly. Yeah. It sounds like it could be, I, I, as I said, I'd have to have another look at, at tube makers to give you a, um, a, a better answer. Um, so yeah, I'll, um, did I do that again? Third time lucky. It's really, it's really determined to show you the plan for today rather than Okay, here we go. Um, so I'll I'll jump in on the discussion that we've been having, and then and then I'll sort of zoom out and talk more broadly about the overall structure. But just just really sort of highlighting the the discussion about whether there was um, an arrangement, and in particular pulling out um, Justice Lindgren's ideas um, and and the understanding whether whether or not there would be enough to reach an understanding. 
but then an acknowledgement that you know the fact that they all end up taking the same court of action um, course of action looks pretty suspicious and we might be able to distinguish apco in that apco involved calls and and text messages around to each other um whereas this occurred with everyone sitting down in the one room having lunch together and so arguably it's easier to to say that an understanding has been formed because they were all in the same room together but even against that you could you could counter by saying that you know and and What's interesting is that um, Justice Lindgren talks about, you know, each person could have left the meeting um, expecting a particular course of action and they people at the meeting might have even aroused that expectation, but um, they don't found an understanding because there's not that explicit undertaking that's been given. Um, so that's that's sort of where I've gone with it. But my point is that if if you wanted to make more of the fact that they've all taken this particular course of action, they're all in the same room having this same discussion together, and they seem to be very deliberate with their language choices. That um, that they're falling short of, of saying that they're in agreement because they know that that will be cartel conduct. Um, if you took that argument, I, I wouldn't mind seeing that um, as long as it was argued with the right reference to um, these legal principles that we've, that we've been talking about. So if, if you wanted to argue cartel conduct, um, that would be fine. Uh, it's just about making sure that the way that you go about it reaches that, that, level of of nuance and critical analysis that's that's required some broader um i suppose structural elements um just a very brief intro and i mean you know in practice you're probably not going to thank your boss for giving them opportunity to advise on something but just some sort of intro um a very quick headline summary about your tentative conclusion. So unlikely to breach, but you could say likely to breach it, um, but we might need more information. Um, discussion of, of the relevant rules. So this comes back to my earlier point of, um, you know, don't just assume, well, they must know the law in this area, therefore I don't need to talk about it. Still making sure that you're including um, that discussion nuanced careful critical nuanced application of the law to the facts and and um some analysis and discussion there consideration of alternate perspectives and then correspondingly what you might say in response to that then moving on and having said so we've we've flagged it in the beginning that um the critical issue is whether this this understanding has been formed We've concluded but there, that there isn't that understanding, but if there was, then the other elements are probably pretty fine. Um, and then finishing with a tentative conclusion that there would that um, there hasn't been cartel conduct. However, we should get more information, and in particular, here's the, the information that we're looking for, some kind of evidence that there might have been or that there was this, this undertaking. And so... Um, and your point earlier about looking for something in writing or or um, being able to to um, have some sort of evidence from the minutes or or memos or that sort of thing that that could be incorporated in this discussion as well. I uh, lost you there, Jacob. Okay. Um, the so had I started talking about this concluding paragraph just about to okay cool so concluding paragraph just talking about reaching a tentative conclusion um and then also discussing you know what the impact other types of um or further evidence might um have on that conclusion and so and your point earlier about looking for evidence of a written agreement or the memos like that that sort of stuff could come in here and and What's what's really important is that we're not just saying um 
we're not just saying, oh, well, you know, if if we get different evidence, then that could change things. We're being specific about here's the evidence that or the type of information that we might be looking for, and here's the the effect, the specific effect that that might have. So, you know, if there was evidence that there was an undertaking, then that that starts to go towards showing that there would be an understanding that there would be cartel conduct. So being being specific rather than general when we're talking about gaps in the information and, and what more information we might need. Now, the exam side of things, Jacob, you talked about mm-hmm. having two different uh, topics coming into play. Yes. Um, so from a layout point of view, you would sort of have one heading that this is what this relates to. You do what you've done there. Then you'd have the second heading of what it would relate to. And then you would have, rather than trying to combine the two together. Yeah. So I'd, I'd do, um, let's say, let's say you had some scenario where it was um, uh, this plus um, uh it doesn't lend itself to a combination, but yeah, if, if there were two issues, you you might do um, on the review of the facts provided, there seem to be two issues, one breach of competition and consumer act two consumer protections, whatever it is. Um, and then do, you know, um, competition and then two consumer and then Blah, blah 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 and then um so you might one what, question oh, yeah yeah sorry. go ahead no no go ahead jason so you've talked about section 45 in this advice here but mm. um you know section 45 is contracts arrangements and understandings that restrict dealings or affect competition but then you've got the cartel conduct provisions that are like section 45 double a to you know f or whatever so is, is it this is it correct to be taught when you when i refer to say section 45 does that subsequently include all of those letters within it because that's some confusion i've got that you know section 45 to me that's located in other provisions it's a different thing to cartel conduct as in so thinking about anti-competitive conduct that's not cartel conduct well, yes, sort of, because you've got item four there, which talks about is there, uh, is it affecting competition or something? And it's it's confusing me as to whether we're looking at forty five, which is in other provisions, and it's it is about competition and arguably related to cartel conduct, but cartel conduct is specifically under division one. So, what is the distinction? Because it seems like your answer might be trying to cover both. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That's a really good question. I think. I mean, in two minutes, uh, what I yeah. might do, I'll, I'll give a um, a more detailed response on teams. But broadly, what what you should be thinking about is, um, and I mean, this this raises a a broader point as well about um, what what you can cover or what you can be expected to cover in the exam. Um, but specifically to your to your question, you can address it from the perspective of section 45 dealing with um, with anti-competitive conduct, which could be cartel conduct, could be uh, some of the other types of conduct listed in the act. So, um, you know, we, we talked in the lecture materials about um, boycotting or, or um, some of the other um, sort of market share issues um but coming back to this common theme around section 45 as establishing um problems with um with anti-competitive conduct as as something that the the legislation's generally uh targeting yeah i guess the only thing i noticed was that the penalty specifically for cartel conduct seems to be massive compared to what the other provisions seem to be Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's fair. Um, and, and I mean, even we, we sort of skipped over the discussion, uh, that we were going to come back to around, um, around penalties, but looking as well at the different ways in which, um, those penalties can be, can be calculated. So 45, um, AF and 45 AG give, um, give different 
um, different methods of, of calculating the penalties as well. Um, what, what's worth considering, and, and it's sort of a, a broader policy question, but the when the ACCC's in the scenario of looking at these sorts of things, they will be giving consideration to um, which pathway of, of penalty that they might like to, that they think they have the best chance of securing and looking at arguing down that particular route, let's say. Um, and so this one, this uh, question's a little bit tricky because it doesn't give you that, necessarily give you that frame of reference. Are you the ACCC? Are you... Um, one of these these industry players, um, but uh, yeah, thinking about those different different penalties, it's 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 safer to assume that that the bigger penalty might apply than than the smaller one, um, if if you can if you can focus on that way. The very last thing I'll just quickly say um, in relation to the exam is just to be thinking about, we've talked before about length of the exam. Um, so this, this response is coming in at, um, you know, about 800 words. Um, I've said previously that, that, you know, you'll, the exam tries to take a, a, a realistic approach in terms of what, what you can get done in the time. And so for example, um, in a in an in a response that has more time and more um more words, let's say, um, I'd I'd expect to see a much more detailed consideration of the cases and and distinguishing them. But um, what I've tried to do here is take a a more uh, an approach that fits more closely with you know what what would be reasonable to expect from a limited scenario in the exam. Um, and so uh, I'm just kind of tr trying to pull out a good example. So thinking about, you know, one of, one of the things that you could say in, in more detail would be to pull out some of the ideas around um, uh, the, the, in APCO with, with petrol, they had the opportunity over, a long period of time to cement the the understanding or to or to establish a pattern of behavior where they would um follow pricing or, or not follow pricing whereas in this instance it seems to be a one-off so you know there's there's plenty of detail that you could discuss that's not um necessarily covered in in this example um but i've done that to suggest you know your exam your exam answer obviously ideally should be as good as possible and, and should cover as much as possible, but it's not, um, uh, you know, it, it's realistic in its expectations of, of what you can cover in, in the time that you're given. Uh, cool. Well, I'll, I'll pull together some ideas around tube makers and, and, um, the structuring around section 45 and post that up on teams, but we'll, we'll leave it there. Um, cause we've, past the hour mark thank you all very much for Remember, coming on. You'll upload on week nine week. yes yep yeah yep. so the week the week nine will, will come up on yeah i'll put it in week nine with the with the recording all righty thanks everyone uh have a good week